Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is a very, very recent case and it does not have a lot of information. And I know I said pretty much the same exact thing last week, but that's just kind of how the cards have fallen with the cases that I've been feeling like I need to cover recently. Um, and especially this one in particular, I feel like there needs to be a lot more attention on their story to get it out there to see if there's anyone that maybe even possibly knows something or saw something or remembers something or anything. I actually had a friend at school bring this case to my attention and he expressed concerns about how these types of cases just are not investigated very well and because this case happened on a reservation, there's a lot of confusion with who takes responsibility of the investigation, so it takes a while to even get the investigation started and then it ends up being a federal investigation. But again, because of where this case happened, it just has not been talked about a lot and I want to use my platform to change that. This case not only hits home for me because it happened in the state that I live in, but because cases like this affect my friends who I care so much about and these are types of things that they are faced with every single day of their lives. So with that being said, let's just get into today's case. Today we are going to be discussing the unsolved murders of Philip and Matthew Reagan. Matthew and Philip Reagan are brothers from Ohio in a town near Cleveland. Matthew was 39 years old, a devout Catholic, and worked as an engineer who designed HVAC systems and traveled all around the country for his work. He had five sons, the youngest being 19 months old, with his wife, Faye. Now, Matthew and Faye were high school sweethearts who had their first date at a local coffee shop until this grew into a weekly meetup every Saturday for a year. Faye described Matthew as romantic. He would always bring her flowers, jewelry, and cupcakes for no reason at all. He would always text her when he was on his way home from work or when he was out traveling around and never let her forget that he's thinking about about her and the kids and would always say that he's just really excited to get home and see his favorite people. He loved playing Irish music that the rest of the family hated, but he loved it and he would dance all around to it with his boys. Him and his boys would also build bicycles together. He helped them with school projects and their math homework. He was a very devoted father who did whatever he could to make his wife and kids happy and feel appreciated. At work, his manager described him as hardworking, analytical, and witty, yet laid back and soft-spoken. He was very well liked by everyone around him and nobody had a single bad thing to say about him. Philip was 29 years old and he worked as a maintenance worker at an apartment complex. His friends and family described him as being funny, witty, generous, and very, very hardworking. Matthew's five boys knew Philip as Uncle Phil's and they absolutely loved him. They said that he was just so full of energy and loved building igloos with them in the winter. He always had plenty of candy for the kids around Christmas time and he loved to tease them with jokes and sarcasm. He was just basically like their big brother. Now, Philip had just landed a new job in California, so this would be his first real time leaving home. Given that this was clear across the country, he would have had to pass through seven or eight states to get to California from Ohio, and depending on the route you take, this can be an absolutely beautiful drive with so many things to see along the way. So because of this, Matthew decided that he wanted to join his brother for the ride to explore the beautiful mountain ranges, forests, landmarks, and just everything that this country has to offer. It's not every day that you have the opportunity to travel all the way across the country. So sometime in the beginning of March of this year, 2020, they packed up their SUV and left Ohio excited to embark on their road trip. Of course, before leaving, the family was concerned about the coronavirus and told them to stay cautious. The family was also worried because, again, this was Philip's first time being so far away from home and this whole thing was completely new to him. But Philip was so excited to start this new chapter in his life and his family promised him that they were going to visit him on his 30th birthday, which would have been that upcoming April of this year. Plus, he knew that 
that he was always welcome back home whenever he wanted or needed, so he was ready to hit the road and see what life had to offer him. Now, from Ohio, they had planned to go sightseeing all along the route until they made it to California. It takes about 36 hours and 2,500 miles to get from Ohio to California. That is just a rough estimate since I don't know exactly what city in California the new job was in, but Ohio and California are clear across the country from each other, and there are several routes that you can take to get there. Judging by where they wanted to stop, it looks like they would have taken this route, passing through Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona before making it to California. So I don't know the exact date that they left or how long they planned on taking before arriving in Cali. I made a similar trip when I drove from Chicago to Arizona, but I personally wanted to get there as quickly as possible, so I drove across the country in about a day and a half. But you can make an entire week out of this type of trip if you want to stop a lot and look at a lot of landmarks. So what I do know is that on March 21st of 2020, the two brothers were in New Mexico. They had planned on visiting Canyon de Shelley National Monument, which is land protected by the National Park Service and is located near the Four Corners region within the boundaries of the Navajo Nation. This this is a historic piece of land that is one of the longest continuously inhabited landscapes in North America and preserves ruins of the indigenous tribes that lived there. The park encompasses 83,840 acres of land and is entirely owned by the Navajo Tribal Trust of the Navajo Nation. About 40 Navajo families live in the park and it is one of the most visited parks in the United States. The park's most distinctive feature is called Spider Rock and it is a sandstone spire that stands at 750 feet tall. Now, I don't know the exact city in New Mexico that they were leaving from, but I'm going to assume that it was somewhere near Santa Fe since that was along the route. So in order to get to Canyon de Shelley from Santa Fe, it takes about five hours and you have to drive through the Navajo Nation Reservation. So they put the location into their GPS and they were eventually directed through an unpaved road near Sawmill in Navajo Nation. However, what they did not know was that this road was completely covered covered in snow and mud, so their black Ford SUV got stuck on the road on Navajo Route 7, about two and a half miles west of the Sawmill Express store. At this point, it's thought that the two brothers got out of their car and started walking along the road to try and find help. As you can see, the area is pretty desolate with not a lot around it other than a few small neighborhoods, a post office, and a few other small business buildings. There also isn't very good cell service, so I don't know if they knew about this gas station and that is exactly where they were heading or if they were just sort of walking in that direction until they found something and it was just sort of you know, a guess that the gas station would be in that direction. But I do think it's possible that they did know about this location because once you have an address loaded into your GPS, I don't think you need service to continue to see what's around that location. However, later that day, a woman was driving along that same road when she spotted two bodies that were partially laying on the side of the road. They were located about a half a mile or 800 meters away from where the SUV was stuck in the direction of the sawmill gas station. Where she was had no cell service, so she had to drive around until she got service and she called the police. The Navajo police were the first to respond and then later the Apache County Sheriff's deputies arrived on scene. What they saw were two men laying dead on the side of the road, both having multiple gunshot wounds all over their bodies and of course, these men were later identified as Matthew and Philip Reagan. Now, I saw in a few articles that when crimes happen on reservations, the race of the suspect and the victims and the severity of the crimes determines who has jurisdiction to investigate the crime. After looking a little bit more into this, according to the FBI's website, the FBI is responsible for investigating more serious crimes in Indian country, such as murder, child sexual and physical abuse, violent assault, drug trafficking, public corruption, financial crimes, and Indian gaming violations. There are 570 73 federally recognized Indian tribes in the United States and the FBI has law enforcement responsibility on nearly 200 Indian reservations. 
This jurisdiction is shared concurrently with the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Justice Services. Then located within the FBI's Criminal Investigative Division, the Indian County Crimes Unit is responsible for developing and implementing strategies, programs, and policies to address identified crime problems in Indian country for which the FBI has responsibility. And that is read pretty much directly off of the FBI's website, so it does seem very confusing on who is responsible for investigating what. Now, obviously, these two men are not Native Americans, so the FBI took over the case and is now investigating, but I didn't see mentioned on the FBI website whether this is different depending on if the victim is Native or not. I'm not sure if race is taken into account, so if there is someone who knows more about this, please let us know in the comments below because I'm honestly not sure. Now, this jurisdictional maze is a huge reason why so many crimes on reservations go un solved, but that is not the only problem. Now, this is sort of just talking off the cuff based on a conversation that I had with a friend who grew up on a reservation in Arizona, but this applies to reservations all over the country. So first of all, so many of the hospitals, doctor's offices, police stations, and any other emergency services are located so far apart that it takes a very long time to arrive when a crime or injury has happened. It can take hours to get to certain locations, so by the time help arrives, even if someone calls before they're fatally injured, it takes so long that it's often too late. Or the fact that when someone does drive to see a doctor, they are so far apart that people often have to drive a very long distance just to get there, so a lot of people will avoid going to the doctor in the first place. Then there's a problem of domestic violence and violence in general that just goes unnoticed and people are just left to suffer. And it's because there are so very little resources to access when you live in these types of areas. And when a crime even happens, a lot of times, nothing is even done about it. This cycle just continuously repeats itself and it makes for a complete mess. Having the cycle of violence, plus the lack of resources, plus the lack of investigating when crimes do happen, it just makes it a recipe for disaster. Whether it's someone who is native and is living on the reservations who as you've heard me speak a lot on before, are definitely at higher risk for being murdered or abused, or if it's someone who's just passing through, the problem remains as we are seeing in this case. So now going back to the case at hand, of course, these men's bodies were sent to the medical examiner and of course, their deaths were ruled as homicides. It's pretty much assumed that these men got stuck and then they were walking around for help and then they were shot several times before making it more than a half a mile away from their car. And obviously at this point in most videos, we would talk about the investigation that's being done and the theories. However, because this is such a recent case, we really don't know anything about the investigation. The FBI has declined to release much information because it's an ongoing case. So I'm just going to tell you what we do know now and I will keep you updated on my Twitter once we find out more information. So the Navajo Department of Criminal Investigation and the Apache County Sheriff's Office are working together with the FBI to figure out exactly what happened. Sean Call, the special agent in charge of the FBI field office in Phoenix, said, quote, we are confident someone knows who is responsible for the murders of Matthew and Philip Reagan. The the FBI and our law enforcement partners have logged many hours of investigative work on this case. The FBI does not forget. No matter how much time has passed, we will continue to aggressively pursue this investigation. We are dedicated to protecting all of our communities and to pursuing justice for Matthew and Philip Reagan, their family, and their friends. So it has been quite a few months since the bodies were found and we really haven't found out a lot about the investigation or anything else that's happened since then. So the most recent update that I saw on this case was from October 6th. So the FBI has executed some outstanding tribal arrest warrants in Sawmill. The arrest warrants are for failure to appear, among other charges. 
Now, this is the same article that said the FBI and other investigating agencies are saturating the area to pursue investigative leads and gather information in connection to the two men. So this makes me think that there have been witnesses or suspects that they have spoken to that led them to believe that someone knows something and that their main concern is getting that person or people to come forward. They have also put out a reward of $10,000 for information leading to an arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for the murders. So that is all we know. I know it's a little bit frustrating and I'm sure you are hoping for more, but I simply don't have anything else. Again, the reason that I am making this video is because I want to get their case out there. I want this case to get more attention, especially since it seems like investigators are just trying to find people to come forward with information that they know. I truly believe that if we work really hard to get this case out there, that there's a good chance of someone seeing this video and seeing their faces and maybe even remembering something. Maybe someone mentioned something to you that didn't seem significant at the time, but could actually be important information to this case. Maybe someone saw these men in the area without even realizing it. There are literally so many different possibilities, and even though I know this is not the normal type of video that I do, where it's more of a story and a case that happened where we can dissect the investigation and what happened, I ask you that you please share this video or any of the resources that I list down below because again, the more people that see their faces and names either in this video or articles, someone might realize that they did see these men at some point or that they heard the names or something. Just getting attention towards this case is so, so very important. I normally would try to speculate why this may have happened, but to me, this honestly seems very clear that it was a just completely random attack. A case of someone being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It doesn't really seem like a case of someone who knew them and was maybe trying to get revenge on them or something like that because there's no real way that anyone could have known that they were going to be where they were when they were, especially because they were on a road trip and road trips usually don't really follow rules. You just get to wherever you're going whenever you get there. You don't really know exactly where you're going to stop. You might find new places on the way there that you want to stop at. So there's really no way that you can stalk someone or follow someone when they're on a road trip, especially without being noticed. Because I feel like if you were driving all the way across the country and someone was watching you the entire time, you'd probably notice at some point. I don't think it's really possible that someone was stalking them or following them and was just waiting, hoping that somehow maybe they would get into trouble and have that as their opportunity to strike. I just don't think that that seems very likely at all. I also know that some people will jump to maybe a murder-suicide of one of the brothers you know, killing the other one and then taking their own life to make it look like a random attack. But again, I just don't think this is very likely. I think if there was any sort of hostility between the two brothers that Matthew probably wouldn't have even gone on this road trip in the first place. I feel like it's very easy to get out of a road trip if you're really that annoyed with the other one. And I obviously have not seen anywhere that there was any negativity between the two in their entire lives. From what I have seen, they were very close and their families loved each other and they just got along very well. And obviously, again, you probably wouldn't want to go on that long of a road trip with somebody if you knew that you guys didn't get along very well. So again, I do think that it's very clear that this was most likely a case of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. But unfortunately, that makes it even more difficult to pinpoint a motive or any suspects. So again, we need more exposure to this case. We need more eyes on this case. I genuinely believe that that is the only way that we're going to find a resolution in this case. Matthew's wife, Faye, has said that she is beyond grateful and relieved that authorities are treating this case as a top priority. She said, quote, I am begging and pleading on behalf of our five sons, myself, our family, and our friends that anyone who knows anything to please find it in their hearts to come forward and share anything that they know, no matter how minor it may seem. We are desperately waiting for answers as every day we struggle with the loss and immeasurable heartache of losing Matt and Phil. So investigators are asking that if you know absolutely anything, no matter how big or small it may seem, to please come forward with what you know. 
the following resources are resources that you can use to send in tips and of course these will be listed down in the description box as well you can call the fbi in phoenix at 623 466-1999. You can also contact the Navajo Department of Criminal Investigations in Window Rock, Arizona at 928-871-7519 or Apache County Sheriff's Office at 1-800-352-1850. Tips can also be submitted online at tips.fbi.gov. So that is all the information I have on today's case. Thank you guys again so much for taking the time to listen to this case because again, it just needs some exposure. I have also listed the FBI's poster down below if you wanna go ahead and share that. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and make sure you go ahead and share this video to get the story out there. Don't forget to subscribe. I put out new videos every single week and don't forget to put on your notifications if you want to be notified of any future videos. Also, don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, especially Twitter, because that is where I keep the most updated with any case that I cover, especially these more recent ones where I want to give you guys the most updated information whenever it comes out. So again, make sure to go ahead and follow my Twitter to keep updated on this case. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I know a lot of people leave comments below on cases that they want me to cover or they'll send them over in my DMs on Instagram. And I do look at those cases and I do cover those cases, but the place that I check the most for suggestions when I'm sitting down to look for a case to cover is that email. So again, make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!